Uh, our next speaker comes from Apollo. Uh, it's Ashley Narcissa. I hope I said your last name correctly. Um, this should be a really interesting chat on observability in GraphQL. And so I'm really looking forward to this. And I think it's going to be one of our more unique uh, outsider talks from what we've had uh, so far, at least in terms of the fringe of GraphQL uh, tech abilities. So Ashley, what, can you share your screen? And we'll get this started. There you are. No audio yet, though. You'll have to repeat that, uh, that amazing intro. And also, I just want to point out that wall. So Ashley is apparently well conferenced. Let him join here again. The Apollo community is no stranger to the GraphQL talking circuit. All right, cool. How's now? That's great. We got you. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? My name is Ashley. I'm really excited to join you guys here today. Um, I don't know if you wanted to dive into some questions or just go right in. I would say just go right in. I think we're, we're going to take it. So I'll leave and it's all you. All right. Sounds good. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen and we'll get right started. Apologies. It feels like every single time is my first time. All right, cool. Can you can you see my screen? In my slides? Uh, I hope so. So, hello everyone. Today uh, I'm going to talk about GraphQL observability and essentially um, a few tricks you can do to help better understand what's happening in your systems of production. So my name is Ashley Narcisse. I'm a software engineer at Apollo. And I have a very strong confession I'd like to make. So I love GraphQL. Um, if you're new to um, this particular topic, or if you're just exploring um, this, uh, this, this, uh, this track in the conference and you wanted to learn a few more, I'll just go over very quickly um, a little bit about, about GraphQL and what it is. Um, so it is a specification, um, just a set of rules uh, defining uh, how uh, data is uh, formed. Um, it is a query language uh, to essentially query your data in your domain, uh, your different um, different types of data sources. It is not a database, um, contrary to the slash QL. Um, definitely a huge confusion point, but um, we'll make that note there. And it complements REST. Uh, so it's not here to replace REST. It, um, it can work well with it, uh, but it can also work well standalone. So the spec specifies a uh, schema as well as the type systems. So here we see that we've abstracted out our user domain. So we have a few fields um, that define what a user is, as well as in our query imitation, we define how we can fetch uh, users or a individual user from this particular domain, as well defining what the shape of the data will look like. So pretty similar. This looks very similar, a lot like you know JSON had a baby with TypeScript. So we'll go from there. Uh, one awesome thing about GraphQL is that it's a bit unopinionated in how you feed uh, the data into it. So wherever your data is is coming from, that's all up to you to implement. So there are resolvers where you can define, as you can see here. Um, in our two functions, there's one area where I define a query to the database using my model. And in the users, I'm performing an API call. Now, why would my app be structured this way? That's a very big question. But the capability and the fact that GraphQL allows that flexibility allows you to adapt for different uh, data systems and microservices that you may have. Uh, so this is a great example to showcase the capability. So this, all right, cool. We're, we're fetching the data. But how does the fields resolve? typically using the same approach. So you use the same uh, resolver uh, function signature, and it will have access to that data where you can say, hey, here are the different properties that define what this field will represent. So now if you have a database that might have some very 
uh, unreadable uh, column names, you can do that translation at this layer. So uh, querying GraphQL is also a fun thing because you can simply define it very much in a JSON format using the structure in the schema provided. And the data that you request, you can specify, I only want a few fields out of my data rather than returning every single thing that's available for these particular users. And your response data also matches the shape of the query that you requested. So this is awesome. But <clears throat> this is the fun part. How does this work? Now, I could probably dive into a whole tension on asynchronous programming and how it all goes ahead and resolves these things and kind of like how does GraphQL work underneath. But at the end of the day, what you, we care about is just abstracting our systems and our domains and providing a very clean interface for clients and end users to leverage. But when our applications are out in productions, we still need to understand how to run these systems more reliably. So ultimately, we need to answer the question, how do I know if things are working or if their things are failing? Because if a failure is happening at the end user and it's tickets that these users are reporting or tweeting that an issue is happening, that's ultimately a very, very bad experience. And depending on which context I might have, is has a lot of financial consequences that um, can occur with such. So we need to be a little bit more proactive. The answer to which is observability. Now, observability is, uh, and a whole concept of it is, a um, is borrowed from mechanical engineering or control theory. But, and I can put the definition for it, but it's a little bit uh, difficult to, um, to parse out. So my spin on it is a measure of how well we can understand a system from the work that it does, right? Based on the output that it's providing, our understanding, it can, we, can, we can easily measure that and, and say, all right, cool, whether a thing is working well or um, it isn't. So it really boils down to understanding what's happening inside the system. So that's great. So we have existing tools in place to kind of like solve this problem, but still within the GraphQL space is still very much in a weird limbo phase. So uh, what tools are there? There's a lot of APMs, there's loggings and, and, and platform and providers that we can put in place. So these APMs oftentimes describe observably as having three pillars. So we're going to the first two. So the first one being metrics and another one being logging, which is great. Uh, applications, we should put these information into our application. And um, one thing to be aware of that is that these fall in the category of known unknowns, which are the type of things that you kind of kind of guess or have some premonition on what, things that can go wrong or things that you would want to track that could potentially go wrong. So you put those uh, systems, you put those error logs in place, you might do some correlation and some additional effort to chain these things together to get some sort of insights from the operations that are happening within your GraphQL services or just in, in any service in general or, or with programming. So this is great. But it's the third pillar that's, um, um, that's also mentioned, which is tracing. And tracing is getting a little bit closer to really tackling those unknown unknowns. Like, so this helps us actually take a more hypothetical driven approach to identifying problems in our systems, um, rather than really chasing through logs and different dashboards and toolings to kind of like stitch all these things together. So I'm from Apollo. So like un from a very unbiased perspective, there's a lot of toolings in Apollo Studio that have really, really helped me before I even started working at Apollo tackle this whole problem of understanding what's happening in my GraphQL services and under its underlying uh, microservices that it talks to. So the first one is kind of the operations tab, which is really, really extremely useful, um, especially if you're thinking of like understanding just the overall health of your system, being able to see the P99s, P95s, just the overall reliability and throughput that are happening through your systems, as well as seeing kind of like those key operations now, from a thousand level view, this is perfect because now you can answer the question as to, all right, cool. Uh, these are some of the more uh, more critical operations that are happening in my GraphQL services. 
which also informs the, your decision on how you're going about either modifying or migrating or even deprecating particular fields around that particular area. So this helps you even before you even tackle the, the change in release set to um, have the right strategy in place and not have any unintended consequences. So to go from there, let's talk about changes to our schema. This is a, a great way of uh, getting even more context when things do go wrong. Seeing, all right, the change was made and we released it, but there are areas where <clears throat> certain operations where our clients are making GraphQL requests, uh, essentially that change might have negatively impacted these operations. And we can drill them and identify what these operations are and what those fields were. So we can see here that, all right, cool, there is a expired trial subscriptions column that was, uh, <coughs> uh, that was, uh, how do I say this? Essentially modified and essentially we, we, we know how to move forward about uh, how do we go about resolving this um, issue. So cool, so let's talk about operations now. So when we dive into an error case or an edge case that is happening in our application, we kind of need to be able to, you know, identify what are the root causes. So typical approach that I've done in the past was spin up my dashboards, start to look at logs and piece together the, the, the context and all different informations that tells me, okay, where to even start to look for, or where areas are even impacted um, to even make the change and roll that out and help alleviate this, the issue. So if we can see here, the, this is a trace. In Apollo Server, you can ship your GraphQL level um, resolver traces over into um, Apollo, Apollo Studio and actually capture that. Um, and even for, for, for a more granular uh, or more like say data intensive use case, here's an example of what that tells you. Like, like seeing from this, we can see that uh, every single uh, request to notifications, the, the latency starts to increase. So that kind of informs us on, hey, there's a potential issue in the way that we're aggregating or resolving the notifications that leads to the requests being almost two seconds for a, a list of users. Now, this is extremely powerful information because now I know exactly where to look for and saves tons of engineering time just uh, to, uh, to, to solve the problem. So this is great. Um, you could probably just do a flip a switch and get this information out into Apollo Studio. But initially, you might be working in a context where you're, there's probably some security restrictions. You have some ridiculous firewalls um, uh, settings in place, or you just there, there's just some rules where you can't ship that data out into another system, and it needs to be entirely self-contained. But the tool of GraphQL is extremely powerful. You still want to leverage this while also still having in good insights into what's happening. So this is where open tracing comes from. This is uh, we're borrowing this over from the systems world uh, and bringing it into uh, GraphQL and trying to put this really into the GraphQL picture uh, to help us better understand. Now, this was the first iteration of uh, kind of like the name of the project or the spec really for uh, creating a vendor agnostic format of creating all these traces and consuming it as well as using the standard libraries and with a standard API. There's also open census, um, which does the same for logging and metrics. Um, and these were both incubated under the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So these, lot, these two projects are very similar. So they eventually merged and became open telemetry. So it's an API specification along with a set of frameworks and libraries for really uh, helping teams tool their applications with uh, observability. So if we kind of go into, here we have a view, of, a view or a screenshot of Jaeger. Uh, essentially, you can spin this up in your own infrastructure or you might have other providers or existing um, infrastructure in place to capture these traces. Um, so why not leverage this with GraphQL in addition to whatever additional tracing we can get from Apollo Studio if you are using it. So we kind of got a little bit of Googling um, and some researching into 
uh, NPM. Now, this is something I've been looking for a while and keeping tabs on, keeping tabs on, keeping tabs on. And for initially, there was Apollo Open Tracing, but as of this summer, Honeycomb Apollo also got released, which is great because Honeycomb is also a um, observable lead provider. Um, and you can, there's also Datadog and X amount of uh, platform providers. And the cool thing about it is by using this vendor Nox spec, you can sh uh, capture that information using the Apollo Open Tracing because we're essentially putting in a standard um, interface into our application and shipping that out to our uh, collectors. And essentially we can visualize uh, this information and get the right side of insights when things do go wrong. So how to set up um, Honeycomb Apollo? It's very straightforward. It's really just importing a plugin and um, <laughs> passing that into Apollo server. Now this is a, from a, um, taking, most of my data examples are from an Apollo server context. So JavaScript, so in Honeycomb Apollo tracing, it, in the documentation, you would have to pre um, already uh, set up or enable the instrumentation plugin for Honeycomb. So this taps into that, which allows Honeycomb to connect your traces from your uh, GraphQL down to lower level instrumentation that are enabled. So if you have any database calls that are performing, uh, essentially you can capture those. So what does that look like? Here's another example of traces that I've shipped out to Honeycomb. And you can see here that we're performing a query for a set of orders um, the order overall takes about 700 milliseconds, and we see that we're getting additional, um, <clears throat> sorry, we're getting additional data. So we're getting the compute match and then the get block, and we're seeing the, res the resolver time execution for that. Uh, similarly here, uh, we're diving a bit deeper because where you'll see here, right, there's a viewer which captures, you know, who, who is logged in. But we're also diving in and, and seeing the trace and execution for the get user by email. Now, this is a custom function within uh, my application. And I'm able to get the insights. OK, say, all right, cool. The viewer or whatever it request is happening here, this is the overall um, execution time for it and, and continue on forward. So we can see that um, the anomaly is at the viewer balance. So we would have to instrument that further to get those right set of insights. So. This is really kind of like the, the good picture of, of where well, Observably can really uh, get us to. Um, we hooked that into Apollo, so, um, Apollo Studio using those plugins and connected to any existing infrastructure that are already in place. So it's almost plug and play. And that's pretty much really it that I have for the talk. Now, this is really the starting point. And there's more toolings for uh, Apollo and open, open tracing GraphQL that's still very much in the early stages. The API has been changing quite a bit, but it's, these are leads that can inform you to help better instrument your systems and actually not stay in the dark. So this pretty much uh, sums up uh, what I had. I'm trying to believe I'm, I'm still in, in, in good time. But yes, uh, Jesse, do you know how we are with in terms of time? I was just waiting to get myself kicked into the stage here. <laughs> um, yeah, fantastic talk. That actually goes into a lot more depth than even a lot of things that I was even aware of. I, I was kind of thinking it was going to go one direction. And um, that, it's a very salient point. In the top in the category of um, GraphQL implementations, because it's one area where people oftentimes, somewhere between here and there, <laughs> there's a performance yeah. model uh, or we're, we're seeing an issue, and there's not a lot of, uh, of observability on the problem. Um, yeah. Let me look at this picture real quick to see if we have any questions. Uh, we do have a question. Is there any link with the uh, Kubernetes um, open, open telemet? Uh, telemetry? That is a very good question. So um, yes, there is a link. Um, and I can put it in the chat. Actually, I have a demo uh, project set up. Fantastic. Yeah. 
Uh, any other questions while while he's pulling the resource up? Any other questions for Ashley? Yeah. So that project uh, has a Docker Compose file, which you can convert into a Q Q um, CRD or a Q file, and essentially publish that to your Kubernetes infrastructure. Fantastic. I just out of curiosity for my own question. Um, so when you have like uh, you can have your like code coverage, right? There's like a thing, there's terms around that space to refer to. Uh, you have complete code coverage. Is there anything in that term for for the control theory and observability to say you have 100% oversight or you you observed everything? <laughs> I don't know. Um. So with that, um. So there is the concept of like s sampling, right? Um. Getting a certain um. Because you you don't want to capture all every single event that happens all the time. Um, if they're they look the same, <laughs> all, all, almost like eighty percent of the time. So what you could do is they could say, all right, cool. For it's twenty percent of the time where that particular event would be different, then I want to store that in. So that is maybe one of the things uh, to also take into account when you start really getting really really beefy and and, and actually putting this into your system because you might have certain uh storage limits uh and, and you want don't wouldn't want to hit those um rate limits um whatnot but um in terms of like the coverage uh really is are along the the kind of like the, the the distributions in terms of the the P, p99s in terms of the, the level of reliability or confidence or essentially your slas um are would be like the the terms or the area that i would focus on in terms of you know tracking the reliability of certain requests Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're basically you're mapping what your promise is and then you gotta make sure that you're identifying it. Yeah, yeah that that's really interesting. Um just looking to, to the chat here, see if there's any more questions that are gonna pop up. But really a very uh timely talk, uh definitely in these areas where um this I mean this is a space that's phase two for GraphQL, really, you know, or you know, phase three, maybe, you know, so phase one, the, the release and the awareness phase two is, you know, large scale adoption in phase three, how to catch the parity up to the other, other specs out there that uh, we're competing against or, or being um, working with. But yeah. I'm, it's looking like that's probably it for the questions. Again, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I know it's early uh, for you giving the talk. So I really appreciate that. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and switch to a break for the next, I think, 20-ish minutes. After the talk, we're going to have uh, Nader Dabit from uh, Amazon Amplify uh, give us a talk about the new, the current ecosystem for GraphQL at Amplify and uh, SDK-driven development there. So uh, definitely come back after the break. But uh, once again, thank you, Ashley. And we will see you guys in a little bit. See you all in a little bit.